about the blood all the time in church. And I wonder if you understand the power of the blood. The power of the blood in your salvation story. If it had not been for the blood, your salvation would not have been possible. Not just any blood had to be pure and undefiled blood. There was only one somebody qualified. Provide some blood like that. Just so happened, Cass, he was a man. Man born just like any other man. Wasn't conceived like any other man. When he was born just like any other man. He walked like any other man. And he talked like any other man. And he went through all the issues of life. And yet, he was without sin. His name was Jesus. And I love when the older preachers would say, he's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. He was our kinsman that redeemed him. And he willingly went to the cross and died for us. Shed his blood for us. That's the blood you were singing about. It's his blood. That gives me strength. From day to day. And the songwriter said, it'll never, ever lose its power. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the blue. Bless you for that. We used to sing those, Sunday, those songs every Sunday. Those kinds of songs every Sunday. Now we just sing them on the first Sunday. For long, we're going to sing them for the first quarter hour on Sunday. We're going to be in trouble if we stop singing. We need those hymns. We need songs that mean something. I ain't got no problem with stomp. But I need somebody to remind me of salvation. Ain't no curse. We started a few weeks ago a sermon series. The series is entitled Pressure Points. Pressure Points. And we're using the book of James and his teachings to identify the issues. that were prevalent in the early church and how he wrote to those believers that they should deal with those issues. And it's one thing to get a message in theory, Jared. It's another thing to know how to deal with it. So we thought that there was no better example in the series than to look at how Jesus dealt with these issues. So we're using James as our foundational study. This, this, this study will be, this morning will be in chapter three. And every, every believer ought to know chapter three of James. Every believer, you ought to, if you want to study something, study chapter three of James. After we get through with this, maybe you'll have a little bit more enlightenment on it. 
We've been going through the Gospels, looking at Jesus' actions and how he dealt with the pressures of life. The first week we talked about how he dealt with trials in his life, trials in his life. Jesus had those days like we all had, where everything happened, seemed like all at once. You wake up, and before you go to bed, every single thing that seemed like could go wrong, or maybe not wrong, just a lot of stuff going on. And I'm, if nobody's told you, I'm going to repeat that mama said there'll be days like this in my life. We tried to talk about that. And then the next week, we talked about how Jesus dealt with temptation. He, he dealt with tempt, temptation directly from the tempter from the father of lies. There was no, there was no minion sin, no imp. Jesus dealt directly with Satan himself. Yeah. And so we talked about the devil made me do it. That's what a lot of people say. And then last time we got together, we talked about partiality, favoritism. We asked, how did Jesus deal with favoritism? We simply pose the question to you, does God have favorites? Today, today we're going to talk about the most dangerous part of your body. The most dangerous part of your body. And if we have to use a central thought, if we have to, then we're going to use as a central thought, you better watch your mouth. Better watch your mouth. So many ways you can say that kindly. You better watch your mouth. Somebody wagging their finger in your face. You better watch your mouth. As if you just said something that you know you shouldn't have. Did, did you know, just from a physical strong point, that the tongue is the strongest muscle in your body. Tongue. Think about how flexible your tongue is. How complex it is. Your tongue can determine solids and liquids. Your tongue. Your, your tongue can also has the ability, the receptors on it to determine sour, sweet, all the different flavors can be detected from, from your tongue. It is a powerful, powerful organ. And, and if you don't believe it, just bite it. If you don't believe the kind of control it has over your emotions, just bite it accidentally. You know when you're going in good on them ribs and you don't slow down and Instead of rib, you grab tongue. It's been estimated that the average person spends one fifth of his life talking. One fifth. That's the average person. There are some of us who are above average in our talking. We have blown the record out. But if you're an average person, sorry, if you're an average person, Man, if they were to put your words into print, but just the words you say every day, then the result would be a single a single day's words for an average person would equal a fifty page book. Single person, your your words for that day would be a fifty page book, and within a year's time, the average person's book would fill one hundred and thirty two books, each with two hundred pages. In. That's how much we talk. It's the average person. Now you put, you know, preachers and teachers and folk in the mix, and there's no telling how many volumes there would be of talking. And so if you had a court reporter to follow you one day and transcribe everything you see, and maybe make footnotes of the stuff you talk, so you think. 
<laughs> if that was possible, what would that transcript look like? How many of your words would be encouraging in that one day's transcript? How many of your words would be prayerful in that one day's transcript? How many of your words would be positive or cutting or, or, or critical? Uh, how many of them would be wasted? How many words would be useless? How many of them would you be ashamed of? Jesus had a public ministry of around three years. That's, that's, that's unquestioned. From the time he was an adult, when he came back on the scene, his public ministry was about three years. And based on the statistics, if Jesus had a court reporter, then it would have been almost 80,000 pages of transcript. Or just the words that Jesus spoke based on the formula I gave you. But John tells us at the end of his gospel that Jesus did so much more than ever was recorded in scripture that we couldn't even create volumes that would contain all of the things that Jesus Christ did while he was here. We, we couldn't record it. So many blessings were, were given. And so interestingly, knowing the power of words. Jesus' brother James pins in his instructional letter that of all the things that he's witnessed in his years, the tongue, look at this, listen to these words. He said he calls it a restless evil full of deadly poison. A restless evil full of deadly poison. And he goes on in chapter three to describe it as powerful, like a, like a spark that, that can set a forest on fire. And it can. It can. And he knew that Jesus' tongue did not match his description because he had seen other men utilize the tongue in negative ways. He knew that Jesus was the opposite, was the example Jesus didn't sin with his words. He didn't. He, he never misused his words. He didn't use them carelessly. You, you ever say something and then realize you shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it. It's just a waste of something I just said. I could have kept my mouth closed. Yeah. You know. But what about the times you say something that fit that same definition and you didn't realize? When you've done more damage to somebody or harm someone, maybe not intentionally, but it still had the same effect on them. So what can we learn from the things that Jesus said? And more importantly, or just as importantly, maybe not more importantly, but just as importantly, what can we learn from the things Jesus didn't say? From the times he didn't say anything? Because that's in scripture as well. Jesus knew the power of his words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John 1 and 1 says that the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. Jesus was intimately, because Jesus is the word. Jesus was made intimately aware of the power. I'm having a mic issue. Of his words. And he used to uh, ex give us examples. Watch this. With a word, with a word, Jesus calmed the sea, a storm. Remember he said peace. With a word. Knew the, he knew anybody that can calm a storm with a word knows the value of a word. And, and, and look, we get excited when we read that in scripture because it's an exciting thing. But imagine if the storm is going on in your life. The same Jesus that can calm the storm that's raging in the atmosphere can calm the storm that's raging in your atmosphere too. With a single word, he speaks peace into my soul. Songwriter says, 
That's why I got joy. With the word, he healed the sick. Didn't even have to be in the same location. No. No. Didn't have to be in the same city when he healed for it. Just with the word. Cast out demons just by speaking. Didn't have to touch people. Just speaking. The power of the word was manifest. He taught with authority. He taught as someone who knew the etymology, the, the, the intimacy of the words that he was teaching. So much so that even as a child, adults would sit around in his company and listen to his teaching. This is how Versed he was in scripture. And watch this now. He didn't always give an answer when he was talking to folk. This is how powerful speech and the word is. Sometimes instead of giving the answer, Ashley, he'd ask questions to make you figure out the answer. That, that's how powerful he knew. I don't need to tell you because you have enough in you to figure it out. When they questioned him, he said, well, whose image is on the coin? Yeah, when he wanted to teach them about patriotism and whether or not they ought to give reverence to the local leadership. He didn't tell them, pay homage to Caesar, who was not a good man. He simply asked him if Caesar's name, and simply said, who, who pictures on it? Well, then if it's his picture on it, give it to him. What is in the law? He asked them. How do you read the law? Well, do, do you do that with your children? Every time they ask you for something, make them think, make them work it out. Make, make them work out the answer to it. Because if you always give them the answer, then they'll get a point where they don't know what the answer is and you're not around. What do they do? But if you help them learn to figure it out, yeah. Which of these proved to be a good neighbor after he told the story of this man who was injured by the way as he came down the dangerous yeah he yeah uh, yeah 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 he was eliciting their response to racism at that point in case you don't know one of the essence of the essences of the good samaritan story is that he took the one who was hated in the community and made him the hero of the story and he made the ones challenging him have to verbalize that the Samaritan was the hero. They never would have said that of their own volition, except they put themselves in a position to be called out by a man named Jesus. And then he, he challenged his own disciples in the way you need to challenge yourself every day. He turned to them and he said, well, who do men say that I am? Who, who do they say I am? I, you, you ought to be able to answer that question. They also taught in parables, still confounding us today. We, we got people who go out and, and write master's dissertations on Jesus' parables and, and still don't, don't necessarily get to the heart of it. Words have power. Jesus realized the power of his words. And he also understood that it's through the word that you and I get to learn him and become more intimate with him. And so you ought to apply that in your everyday walk. If you're in a position that your words have significant value over people, then you need to be careful how you use those words. If you lead somebody, if you're a, a supervisor on a job, be careful how you use your words over people. Be careful how you talk to them, how you question them. Uh, 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 leadership and lordship, two different things. Yeah. If you're leading people, they should be growing under you. Leadership. Yeah. When, when you give directions to the people under you, do you do it with respect? Uh, do, do your words come out perfumed with love and grace when you talk to people? 
when you're dealing with the public, people in trouble, people who need the services you render, do they feel the love of Christ in your communication? Or are they simply peppered with the irritation that you feel at the moment? How do your words impact them? I'm struggling. I'm sick. I don't need you fussing at me too. Can you help me? Your words can do that. Sometimes you can talk to a person and your words can be a perfume in their life. It can be just what they need at the moment to lift them and encourage them. What about the words you say to your spouse? Are they always loving? Do your words come out at all times with I do and I will? I still do and I still will. Or is it just frustration? Oh, don't get me wrong now. After right at 36 years of marriage, I understand the issues of the day. Too often than not, the issues of the day take priority to us being encouraging. But just be mindful of that. Jesus never exercised, he never powered up with his words. Uh, in a community, we call somebody who, who kind of bullies you, Debo. -ing. Anybody that's ever watched Friday knows who Debo is. He's just a big dude that is because he's bigger than everybody else, rides around the neighborhood bullying them. And he only does it because he's bigger. And his name is Debo. And even all the guys run from him. Yeah, but we can debo people with our words. We can push people away with, with words. We can, we can, and Jesus didn't do that. He, he didn't do that. Let me, see, let me show you how I know. And the reason he didn't do it is because he chose not to. Let me give you some perspective. Jesus was the truth. He could have gone around every day reminding folk that this is the way you have to live. This is how you have to do it. And he could have given them the truth all day long. But all he would have done under those circumstances is, is remind people constantly of how awful they were living. And people are likely to turn around and then want to follow you when they're in that state. So it's difficult to encourage and, uh, and lift people up if all you do is knock them down. Jesus knew that. Yeah. He didn't come. He didn't come just to, to, to make a point came to make a difference. He, he didn't come just to tell folk they were living wrong. That was part of it. But he also came to show them how to live right. That's our job too. We got to show people they live right. When he called Matthew the tax collector who had been cheating and conniving folk all these years and he said, Matthew, I'm coming to your house. You're going to throw a party for me today. Well, he, who is Matthew going to call to his party except other tax collectors? Nobody else wants to hang out with him. And so if he's having a community function, that's who Jesus met in his house. Those other folk who would also be identified as sinners. He could have sat in the house, Jessica, and said, y'all been killing folk and taking advantage of them all day long. But he didn't rebuke them when he went in the house. He loved them. He let them know that the same thing that is going on with Matthew can also go along with you, too. In fact, the only people he rebuked that evening were the people who wanted him to rebuke them. <laughs> Those are the only ones he put in place. Jesus didn't rebuke the woman at the well when he told her about her whole life. Don't you know your friend tired of you telling them their life ratchet? Yeah, every time you tell your friend that life is ratchet, all you're doing is puffing up. They know it. They know it, and they also get defensive every time you come around. Yeah, they need loving, not reminding every time. They need example. And that's what James is saying that Jesus showed us by example, that we can love the hell out of some people, the wrong out of some people, but we don't have to use our tongue to batter them and beat them down every single time. There's a place for it. 
sometimes people need to be directed. They need to be put in perspective because when you live in a circle of people who are living foul, that becomes the vocabulary you're used to hearing. And it's only when you can get outside of that and realize that there's another way of living that you can get the perspective. And you realize everybody don't get high. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, because you, you, you say to yourself, hey, everybody I know get high. Yeah, you, that's right. You're right. Everybody you know get high. But it's a whole lot of folk out here you don't know who don't get high, <laughs> all right? We need a different perspective on that. And only when you, you know, come out into the wider perspective that you understand that instead of me thinking I'm living in the majority of weed heads, I'm in the minority. But somebody got to give you that perspective. He even rebu rebuked his followers, his disciples. Jesus did when they wanted him to be ugly to some folk. We don't need to do that, he told them. He had to show them a different way because they wanted to use their power or their authority in a way that Jesus didn't want them to learn to teach people like that. But there were times, there were times, Lindbergh, that Jesus didn't say anything at all. He didn't. Yeah, the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery was at the most vulnerable point of her life. Not when she was dealing with all those men. That wasn't when she was vulnerable. She was vulnerable when she came out and was publicly put in a dangerous spot. Everybody was about to stone her. Most vulnerable point in her life. And they called Jesus, not because they cared about this woman. They were still trying to set Jesus up. And they called Jesus and they asked him, what should we do with this woman who was calling the very act? I would add, even as the man was standing over there with nobody saying anything. What do we do with her? And Jesus didn't say anything about what she did. The silence of Jesus in that moment was more powerful than any speech he could have given. And then when the moment was just right, just at the uh, in the scripture, Cass, it would say the fullness of time, the clock ticked, and Jesus said, let he without sin cast the first stone. And watch this church. Every one of them left. Every one of them left because they realized the hypocrisy of their actions, but Jesus didn't say anything else. He's just writing in, the, writing in the sand. Just writing in the sand. He might have been writing down the names of the folks standing there who also, yeah, Don is. <laughs> and then when Jesus is confronted by the great grief that's happening in his friend's household, Mary uses her words emotionally when Jesus comes. And, 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 and he, she says to him, you have been here. She uses her words in that manner against Jesus. And, 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 and what does the Bible record Jesus as having said? Nothing. Nothing. There's a lesson in that. Too many of us approach people who are struggling with grief, and we always think we got to find the right thing to say. And more often than not, when somebody's in grief like that, there is no right thing to say. So sometimes you can just sit there, as Jesus did with Mary and Martha when Lazarus died. The greatest example that you can give is to just be there and weep with them. Because that's what he did. He let his tears do his talking. And sometimes you can do that. Just be with people and stop trying to. I can tell you this. I can tell you this, in that situation, a lot of times, I never find the right words to say. In fact, the words that I say, I can find comforting things to say, well, you know, but I don't know how to make them not sound cliche under that situation. And it's difficult. Let me tell you why it's difficult. Because everybody else is coming in saying the same thing. Every person is coming in with the word of scripture. Every person is coming in reminding them how good God is. And so for the preacher, the pastor to come in and separate that becomes very difficult. And so sometimes I just come in 
and I'm just with them. I'm just sitting there. Sometimes we talk about something that's not grief. Something that's a distraction. Because the grief can be so overbearing. It can be like a wet blanket on them and they can't get it off. Sometimes after they come out of that, they can see things a little bit clearer. And then I remind them that God hasn't forsaken them. Yeah, it's difficult. But I want you to know, going there and being there and sitting there and reminding them over and over again for several hours, bad situation they're in, doesn't always help. Sometimes we visit too long. <laughs> Sometimes we stay too long on the visit. Just go in there and remind them. We do that at the hospital and we do that at folks' houses. I'm digressing now. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes a short visit says more than a long visit. Yeah. Now I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, I don't stay in hospital rooms long when I come and visit folks. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. But I know you're supposed to try to get a little rest in the hospital and you can't rest when you've got some folk in there with you. Because you always feel, no, no matter the fact that you're in the bed, that you should be entertaining them some kind of way or saying something to them. And so take that pressure off people. Visit them and then, and then leave. Time and again, the scriptures talk about the tongue. Over and over and over again, James gives us this whole chapter. And he tells you the danger of the tongue. How many of you heard of Aesop fables? Yeah, Aesop was famous for his writings. And Aesop tells the story of the leader Xanthus having a large festival and inviting all of these dignitaries to the festival. And in order to impress them, Xanthus requires Aesop to prepare a meal that would be extraordinary. He tells them to come to the feast and Asap spares no expense. And he gives them a meal of several courses. But in each course, the feature is made of tongue. In each course, now some of y'all looking strange, but there's some folk in here that have eaten some tongue. Still do. <laughs> But the tongue was the main course. It was cooked in various ways and served with appropriate sauces. And everyone at the festival could say without a doubt that each one of the courses was absolutely fabulous. It wasn't until Xanthus inquired and asked, what is it? What is this delectable? entree or what are these delectable dishes you've given us made of? He demanded of him that he tell him and Aesop said that each one of these dishes has as its main source tongue. Now initially Xanthus was mortified that he would take something that seemed so common and serve it to his dignified guest. But when he asked Aesop about it, he said to him, what is it that's any better than the tongue? What is it? He said, nothing excels the tongue. Yeah, it is the great channel of learning and philosophy, and it's a noble organ that addresses and you, it addresses audiences and utilize, eulogizes people. But not only that, nothing equals it when it comes to its performance. And all of the people in the party applauded Aesop for his brilliance, not only in preparation for the dish, but also in his explanation of why he chose it. But because he couldn't be outdone, Xanthus, the leader, said, tomorrow you'll come again and you will prepare dishes. Once again, for these people, because I just believe that this is not the way it should end. And he said, but tomorrow, instead of bringing me something with the, 
the, di the dish that has the best beats, I want you to bring me something with the worst and see how you can do that. And the next night, Aesop came, Aesop came again and he had prepared a full menu of dishes. And each one sat there and enjoyed it significantly. <laughs> and at the end of the night, Xanthus asked him, now what was in all these dishes? And once again, Aesop said, I hate to tell you, but the dish that has the worst is also the tongue. <laughs> Xanthus was about to have him drawn and quartered because he was disgusted. And Aesop once again showed his brilliance by asking the leader, what can be worse than the tone? What can be best then? But what can be worse than the tone? It's the same tone um, that wickedness comes from. It's the same tone that can set a fire ablaze the same tongue and that starts treasons and violence and injustice, the same tongue. And so likewise, as it's the best, it's also the worst. Now, Aesop got it right. The question is, do you understand it in your life that the same brilliance that comes from your mouth, blessing, the same mouth can also produce cursing? Not in one life, in one day, in one conversation. Yeah, we can bless and curse folk at the same time. And so how do I deal with that in my Christian walk? James tells me, verses three, I mean, chapter three, verses one through 18, that the tongue's power must be bridled. If I do not bridle the tongue, then I am struggling not just in my Christian walk, I'm struggling in life. If I don't control my, th my tongue, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. You must know, according to James, the power of the tongue. Watch this. The tongue is so powerful that with a little bit, a bit, a horseman can control the whole body of the horse. Just putting a little bit in his mouth. He can turn him right or left. They can go forward or come backwards. All because of the bit that's in his mouth. I hope you understand where I'm going here now. I'm not telling you that you ought to put a bit in your mouth, but sometimes you ought to bite your tongue. Because if you bite your tongue sometimes, it will stop your body from going places that you don't want it to go. Power of the tongue is so significant. And he uses the examples here of the tongue and the bit in the horse's mouth. He also uses the fact that from one small steering place that a ship can be controlled. A mighty ship. Mighty ship. A lot of y'all got these nice fancy cars now and they come, they come with a little dial in it that you can, you can control all of the car with. But do you know that a cruise ship is the same way? Huge cruise ship that may have three, 5,000 people on it the captain has a dial that he can control the entire ship with. That's how powerful a small thing uh, can be. You got to know the power of the tongue and how you can control it. Because if you control the tongue, you control the man. How many folk have gotten themselves in so much trouble, not because of what they did, but because of what they said? Because once said, you cannot unsay it. You can't undo it. I don't care what anybody does. How many people, this is what's frightening, and I'm, I'm really concerned. How many people are in trouble today for something they said 10 years ago? 10 years ago, that's coming back. Because once said, you cannot unsay it. And I'm so concerned about the, the, the problems that exist for this generation because we are such a media-driven, technological generation. And I want you to be aware of the fact that apart from uh, 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 
your memory, people have recorded everything you said. In fact, they recorded stuff you forgot. When folk come in and say, I don't, I don't remember saying that, they may be telling the truth, but the scandal may create problems for you. You should not be walking in this walk of Christianity and not be aware of the, hip, the hypocrisy of blessing and cursing at the same time. It ought to do something to you. And I don't expect a whole lot of amens because every one of us is guilty of this. Every single one of us understands that our mouths can undo our witness every day. What we say, how we do it can tear us up. Not only that, you also ought to be aware that your greatest asset as a believer is your witness and your talk. And so when you control it, not only do you bring blessings to yourself, but you share those blessings with other people. So understand that with that small little tongue, you have the ability to grow or stunt someone's growth. And I love this about what James is writing now. James is not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to believers. He's not sending this out to folk who don't love Christ. He's talking to folk who are in the church. He's telling them, you got to watch what you say. We're not concerned at this point about those who are outside the fold, just in the fold. Don't tear down your witness. He's also saying that it's inconsistent to claim your redemption by Christ and then not show it, not live it. And so we ought to be consistent in our speech. I can't make that point enough. We ought to be consistent in our speech. We got to show what we say we are. And then we also got to know the reason and the way our tongue is redeemed. How do you talk better? Well, you talk better by putting better in you. All right? You put them. <laughs> I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to get out of your way. If all you do all day is dine, what's the terminology on you? Is dine on a menu of ratchet? You'll talk ratchet. Is that the terminology? Cam, you know. Come on, tell me. <laughs> if all you do is dine on negativity, guess what's going to come out in your conversation? If all you do is disparage and discourage, guess what's going to come out in your conversation? But you need to be able to go to the source of encouragement. And we believe that source is the scripture. We believe that living in fellowship with other folk who are also encouraging you creates a healthy dialogue among folk. And I'm not saying that that's, you have to be exclusive to that. I'm not saying that. I know we have to live in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. And when you're taking only the world's order as your instruction, then you're only going to spit back the world's order. And that's never going to get you there because the world's order, the world's wisdom is earthly and it's unspiritual and it can even be demonic. That's the world's order because he is the ruler of this world. And he's going to make its systems fit his situation. But Jesus Christ came to save us from the devices of this world, which means you have to learn what, what he said. What would Jesus do really does matter. What would Jesus say really does matter. And the only way you can learn that is by studying, by studying his word. Godly wisdom comes from above. Godly wisdom comes from holiness and, and healthy situations. And it's characterized by peace and by purity. That's godly wisdom. Many of you know this. Many of you started out early on in a household where you were being taught properly. You were being shown properly, and you decided when you got old enough, you were going to do it a different way. Well, I came to tell you right now that maybe you need to look at some of the older ways and those traditions because they make a difference in how you live. And watch this, and I'm out. You now have a different methodology of putting out your witness than just what you say. Yeah, there's a different way we do it now. Now we say things, but we have gotten into this bad habit of trying to show on social media what our witness is. Be careful how you try to project yourself because the very image you project 
all right, the very image you project may not fit the lifestyle you're living. And that's happening every day. Yeah, you, you, you keep projecting positivity, holiness. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're projecting. But your life isn't showing that. And sooner or later, those two wor worlds are going to collide. And you're going to struggle to put yourself back in place. I'm reminded of all the preachers who put themselves out there on social media, have very active social media campaigns, but they're not living there. And before long, their lives collide. The, the life they're living becomes apparent, not the life they're showing, but the life they're living. And I'm telling you, it doesn't just happen to ministers. They're just more high profile. It happens to all of us. So be careful. You got to control your tongue. You control your tongue, it'll control your living and your life. Let's look back again at that transcript. You know, the one we talked about at the beginning of this message. The 50 page transcript. Let's look back again. While you might not have any control over what happened in that transcript yesterday, I came to encourage you and tell you, you have all the control on what happens for the rest of this day and moving forward. You can control what's recorded. You can control what people see and what people read if they had the opportunity to read it. But more importantly, not folks, you, you have the control of what you see if you were to read it back. You'll know what you've done properly. Some of y'all, some of y'all probably cringed a little bit about what would be in there yesterday. I did. I did. But tomorrow's a new day. You got to make a correction today. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to take advantage of the opportunity you've been given through your salvation story? Are you willing to take advantage of the salvation you already have? We, we, we stand in a unique position. And the reason it's unique is because it puts us between two places in life. And the two places in life that we are in is we're already there, but we're not quite there. What a tough place to be in. Already there, I'm saved. I'm sanctified every day I'm sanctified, but guess what? Every day I gotta get up and be sanctified. I'm saved, I'm sanctified, but the struggle is being sanctified every day. You need to hear me. That's the struggle we face. And it's the struggle that every person faces every single day. You are not alone. You gotta be in control of your situation. So my question to you today is, are you willing to take control? Did you even know that you needed to? Did you even know that Jesus Christ gave us an example of how to live that way? Did you know that he came and he lived and he died for you? Did you know that he stopped being in heaven for the simple purpose of coming here to be with us? That's what Jesus did. He didn't think it was a negative to leave heaven to come and rescue you and show you how to live. Have you accepted that gift that he's given you? If you're not, I mean, if you have not, I'm empowered by all the officers in heaven to give you an invitation to join in the family that he created. We call ourselves Christians after Christ. If you want to use your tongue in the most positive way that you ever could, first thing you can do is say, I will to Jesus. I do to Jesus. I accept you, Jesus. Most positive decision you'll ever make. And if you've already accepted him as your Lord, I mean, as your Savior, then every day when you get up, you need to use the tongue and say, I accept you as my Lord today. Lead me, guide me into the day that I'm about to experience. Help me to talk right and walk right Help me to be in fellowship with my fellow person. You can say that. If you've never found a place that you can call home, never found a church family, or if you haven't found one that you need to grow in, then I suggest recommend you try us. We're trying. We're practical in our approach. We're trying every day to get better, stay better. Maybe some days we get to the end of the day and we struggle a little bit more than we wish we could. We ask the Lord to forgive us and give us another opportunity. He's been faithful to do that. We're doing that together. 
as this choir sings this song of welcome. The doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. 